This program contains images of the use of the Chlorine Institute's emergency kits A, B, and C in training exercises. Similar emergency kits exist and can be used in chlorine emergencies. However, they will not be covered in this video. For the purpose of clarity in illustrating the use of the kit devices, the first responders depicted are not wearing proper personal protective equipment. Always wear protective gear and ensure proper fit and protection before responding to any chlorine emergency. First responders today are presented with a whole host of challenges on a daily basis. It can range from learning new techniques or equipment, maintaining existing equipment, dealing with budgetary or manpower issues, and not the least of which are the incident calls you field all day and all night long. As a first responder, you know that the first 15 minutes of a response is critical to a successful outcome of the situation. Proper planning and preparation before an incident and the amount and quality of information you quickly gather during the incident will be imperative to the safety of yourself, your team, and the public. This program was developed to help you prepare to act in those critical first 15 minutes. What to do when the call comes in and what you might expect on scene and where to find the resources you'll need to contain it. And while this video illustrates specifically a chlorine release, the techniques and workflow presented are valuable in just about any type of hazmat response. This program is intended to only be an introductory overview for first responders. More detailed chlorine emergency response information can be found in the Chlorine Safety Tour video and additional resources on emergency response, which can be found on the Chlorine Institute's website. Let's first define who might be a first responder. Of course, it's the fire and rescue crew who often get the call first, but depending on the nature and location of the incident, the first responder might be police, a medical team, or a hazmat team. This will be important to you during your response because you'll need to know who is already on the scene and what resources are immediately available. An incident will take many forms, and nothing should be assumed or taken for granted no matter how minor initial indications appear. Releases from valves are the most common leak. However, depending on your locale, chlorine-specific incidents may take the form of motor carrier accidents, train derailments, package failure during highway or rail transport, and incidents involving public infrastructure, like a water treatment plant, a manufacturing plant, or even a public pool. But no matter what the situation might present, the adage that a best defense is a good offense applies. A comprehensive and clear emergency response plan is a critical component to any first response. We'll cover that plan in detail in this video, so let's begin. Chlorine use is widespread and essential to our way of life, from making our drinking water safe and disease-free to producing medicines, herbicides, and many of the plastic products we use on a daily basis. But in spite of the fact that chlorine is all around us in tightly controlled uses, it is a potentially dangerous substance. Exposure to chlorine can cause respiratory distress and can be lethal at some concentrations. If chlorine or similar hazardous chemicals are suspected in an incident, it is critical to take appropriate action, guided by effective and careful planning to protect yourself, your team, and the general public. Depending on your locale and organization's size, the resources available to you may be limited or far away. Recognizing this will help you develop an effective emergency response plan that fits your situation. Responders need to be prepared to work within the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, which is a unified approach to incident command. For example, rural organizations may have personnel who have to wear many hats, may not have specialized hazmat response training or equipment, and the nearest hazmat response team may be hours away. Small city organizations may have more personnel, which may allow for more specialized duties, but still may need to rely on other resources for specific incident containment. Large city organizations may have the luxury of dedicated hazmat teams and larger staff with specialized duties, but resources may be stretched thin due to several simultaneous incidents, heightened security alerts, budget restrictions, and more. 
Based on your organization's makeup, you should have a clear plan for contacting those chlorine response resources available to you in the event of an incident. These resources will include other fire response departments, state and local response agencies, and private contractors. We'll identify some of these agencies in this program. When the emergency call comes in, of course you need to obtain as much information as possible to accurately assess the situation. Your mindset should be focused on gathering the answers to these questions. What are the facts about the incident? What type of container is involved? Is a deliberate criminal act suspected? Is there a visible cloud? Are there any odors? What is the wind direction? What is the topography of the area? Is there a large elevation change? Remember that chlorine is heavier than air and will find low-lying areas. What are my immediate resources? Who can I call for help? Do I have the appropriate contact phone numbers, both mobile and landlines? How should I protect myself, my team, and the public? What are the likely outcomes of the incident? What do I do if civilians are involved? Are there any injuries? What is likely to happen if my crew rushes in without proper preparation? What can I do to prevent further damage? How does our response time affect the incident? Bottom line, can I respond safely? And if I can't, who can I call to help me? At this point, you cannot rule out any potential hazard, but there are specific indicators that might suggest the incident is chlorine-based in nature, including where is the location of the incident? If it's an industrial or public utilities location, chlorine may be present on site and may be involved. If the incident relates to motor vehicles, what kind of vehicles are involved? Bulk chlorine is transported in pressurized vessels that are recognizable by the words inhalation hazards stenciled on their sides. Cylinders and ton containers are transported in both enclosed and open vehicles and trailers. If the incident is a railroad derailment, the types of rail cars involved is a good indication of the volatility of the incident. Chlorine is only transported by rail in pressure tank cars. By obtaining as many facts about the incident as possible within reasonable response time, the better you'll be prepared when you arrive on site. Your pre-emergency plan should identify which resources are potentially available to you and include backup plans if those resources are not immediately available. Even if chlorine is not involved in the incident, there may be equally volatile and dangerous hazardous chemicals involved. Nothing should be assumed. At this point, you should have a general awareness of the situation, but there may be unknown chemicals at the scene that may be inhalation hazards or pose other hazards. Be alert to the wind direction, odors, and topography. Elevation changes affect how chlorine dissipates. Chlorine is heavier than air and will settle in low areas. One of the most important protective measures you take is the proper use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. The nature of the incident will determine what level of PPE you should use. These precautionary measures will not only protect yourself, but your team and enhance your ability to respond to the incident. Your pre-emergency plan identifies on-site personnel roles, lines of authority, and communication networks. The chain of command should immediately be established upon arriving at the incident site. Now is a good time to go over these preparatory tasks before an incident occurs. Protecting the public is also key to a successful outcome, and proper emergency alerting and response procedures should be in place and ready for implementation. You should be prepared to initiate the notification system, including reverse 911, door-to-door -door alerts, and other procedures. As you approach the site, identifying the nature of the contents of containers is critical. Fortunately, there are a number of indicators that help. Placards on vehicles, UN numbers, stencils on containers, way bills, bills of lading, and others. By being alert and gathering this information, you may be able to identify the contents of the containers involved in the incident. 
There are many reference tools available to first responders, such as the Emergency Response Guidebook. The ERG provides a wealth of information on many chemicals. The ERG is also available electronically as a smartphone app directly from the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Other useful phone apps or mobile-enabled websites include WISER, an app that provides chemical, radiological, and biological information for first responders and medical personnel, published by the National Institutes of Health. The AskRail app is a safety tool that provides first responders immediate access to accurate, timely data about what type of hazardous materials a rail car is carrying, so they can make an informed decision about how to respond to a rail emergency. And Cameo, a mobile-enabled chemical data website published by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. There are numerous online and mobile resources not mentioned here, but you should carefully choose which resources you use. Some sources may not be completely up to date. It's recommended that you use only information from trusted sources, such as governmental agencies or reputable emergency response organizations. These tools will not only help you identify the contents, but also the impact of a large spill or a small spill. There are specific indicators to alert you that chlorine is involved. Chlorine is transported as a compressed, liquefied gas in 20, 100, or 150 pound cylinders, 1 ton containers, 20 ton cargo tanks, and 90 ton rail tank cars. In some instances, chlorine is loaded in smaller containers, such as pool shooters, which may contain 20 pounds. Chlorine is placarded UN 1017 for easy identification. Tank cars can be loaded and shipped with chlorine at temperatures as high as 50 degrees Fahrenheit to below 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Pressure on the car can range from 50 pounds to 100 pounds or more, depending on the ambient temperature. Contact the shipper to learn about specific loading and shipping pressures. Chlorine is a gas at atmospheric pressure and temperatures above minus 29 degrees Fahrenheit. So if there's a release from a chlorine container, chances are it will be a gas cloud. Even if liquid chlorine is released from a container, the heat from the atmosphere and the ground will cause the chlorine to boil and turn into a gas almost immediately. At lower concentrations, the gas will be a faint yellowish color. At higher concentrations, it will be greenish-yellow to green in color. Depending on the humidity, chlorine gas is usually not visible at concentrations below about 25 parts per million. It is important to remember that gaseous chlorine is heavier than air, so it will settle in low areas such as basements, creek beds, ditches, sewers, and ravines. Chlorine has a strong bleach-like odor but it's important to know that commercial chlorine and bleach are not the same, and their effects are very different. Bleach is placarded different from chlorine. Chlorine is much stronger than bleach, and the effects of chlorine exposure can be far more hazardous and even lethal at higher concentrations. When your team arrives at the incident site, it's time to put your emergency plan into action. Depending on your resources available to you, your personnel and equipment, several things should happen simultaneously to contain the incident. Establish incident command, establish safe zones and hot zones, secure the site, evacuate and treat victims, and monitor the air. Upon arriving at the site, establish a buffer zone around the site to secure and maintain public safety. Since the release may involve a gas cloud, consider wind direction and terrain when establishing this zone. The first step after setting up the buffer zone is to don proper PPE for a site assessment. Use of binoculars is sometimes helpful to identify leak sources. Don't rush in without properly trained personnel. After the initial site assessment, set up an action plan. Do not spray the site with water because it may make the chlorine release worse. Water reacts with chlorine to produce corrosive acid. Constant monitoring of wind speed, condition, and direction, and if available, chlorine levels, is necessary to maintain the buffer zone and guide the containment process. 
Places of shelter need to be established at a safe distance from the release. These areas will be incident-specific. The size and severity of the spill will determine where the safe distance zone will be located so that exposure to the release will not occur. This shelter is not only the staging area, but also a resting place for responders, so water and first aid supplies should be present. The command post should be located separate from the shelter area in order to facilitate an effective response, but it's important to make sure that staging area and the command post are mobile in case the refuge has to be moved quickly due to a shifting gas cloud or other reasons. Site security is also critical. Work zones need to be established, designated hot, warm, and cold. Control over who enters the hazardous areas must be tightly monitored by the on-site safety officer and appropriate medical monitoring should be determined and carried out. An important security issue to be aware of when responding to a hazmat incident is that the incident may be the result of a criminal act. With that, the preservation of evidence at the scene is an extremely important part of how and when to attempt mitigation of any chemical release. It will be necessary to work in close conjunction with local, state, and or federal law enforcement agencies who may be involved with the incident response in order to maintain proper security at the site. Emergency responders also need to be aware that a criminal act involving hazardous materials may include planned secondary releases of product, for example through timed explosives, with the intent to harm responders. If it is suspected that the release was an intentional act, do not make entry into the site until law enforcement has established perimeter security. Responders should be aware that some tank cars are equipped with tracking devices or similar devices that may look suspicious. First responders should be aware that most shippers use cable seals to secure the tank car prior to shipment. If this seal is broken, this could indicate a deliberate malicious act. Assure that Chemtrek or Canutech has been activated. In the U.S., the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, or Chemtrek, provides immediate advice to you at the scene 24-7 and will in turn immediately contact the appropriate responder group as required. In some cases, it'll be the shipper, but Chemtrek will also activate the Chlorine Emergency Plan, or Chlorep. Chlorep is an industry-wide emergency plan that includes trained emergency teams located throughout the U.S. and Canada that are on a 24-hour alert to handle chlorine releases. The Canadian Transport Emergency Center, or Canutech, is the Canadian dispatch agency and operates very much like Chemtrek in the U.S. Make sure you keep these organizations' phone numbers readily accessible at all times. You should also request safety data sheets, or an SDS, from Chemtrek. These are sometimes referred to as Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDSs. When calling in a report, always leave a callback number to allow for contacting. Finally, Evacuation routes and procedures should be implemented if the incident commander has made the decision to evacuate, because evacuation isn't always needed, depending on the incident conditions. These procedures will include primary evacuation routes as well as alternative exit routes. Vehicles used in the evacuation should be staged and ready to go. Plans for an alternative command post location should be addressed. Once the command post has been established, emergency medical treatment, first aid procedures, and decontamination procedures should be implemented. Identify an area where first aid will be provided. This can be the refuge area or another safe area. You should have information on hand about the whereabouts and availability of the nearest trauma center. There should also be a liaison between your emergency response team and the local medical personnel on the scene who should keep the local hospitals appraised of the situation. A decontamination zone needs to be established that provides adequate protection for medical personnel. The type of decontamination protocol used will be dependent upon the specific type of release. Your decontamination plan will also identify methods for disposing of contaminated protective equipment. It's important to remember that anything or anyone entering the hot zone is considered to be contaminated and must be decontaminated when leaving that zone. 
Of course, the best approach to decontamination is to make every effort to avoid contamination in the first place. If chlorine comes in contact with organic combustible substances, such as oil or grease, explosions and fires may result. The most common ways for chlorine to come in contact with incompatible substances are through spills, releases and container failures. Mitigation of the incident begins with the containment of the release. If the leak is in a cylinder or ton container that you can safely maneuver, rotate the container so that the leak is coming out from the top of the container. Liquid will be on the bottom of the container and gas will be on top. Because chlorine liquid vaporizes and expands into gas by 460 times its volume, it is more manageable to have gas leaking from the cylinder instead of liquid. According to your level of training, initial mitigation techniques that can be used are ensuring valves are completely closed, tightening valve plugs and caps, and tightening valve packing. If these initial attempts do not contain the leak, and you have access to and are trained in the proper use of the Chlorine Institute's emergency kits A, B, or C. Use them to contain the leak. Installing emergency kits are certainly an option to mitigate an incident, but may not necessarily need to be the first option. Be sure to follow the instructions supplied in each emergency kit to effectively and efficiently stop the leak. If it is suspected that the container may be overpressurized, do not cap its relief device until the pressure within the container can be determined. When the response is completed and you and your team are safely off the site, a critique of the response is an essential step to preparing for the next response. This critique should provide an open forum for discussion of the actions that went right and those that went wrong during the response. Follow-up procedures include restocking supplies that were used during the response and cleaning, repair, or replacement of emergency equipment. Finally, assign action items for those that need improvement. A meaningful follow-up critique will allow for continual improvement of the response process. We've covered a lot of material here, and as you can see, there are many facets to an emergency response that will ensure a successful outcome. As we said, this program specifically addresses chlorine release emergencies, but the planning, preparation, and response procedures demonstrated, and the awareness that you will need to possess throughout each step of a response, are applicable to just about any type of incident and will help ensure the protection and safety of yourself, your team, and the public. We reserve much of the details of the information we presented here for the special tab section of this DVD, where you can find more in-depth information on a variety of topics discussed. Take some time to go through that section. Information is a valuable tool during a response, and the more knowledge you have about potentially dangerous situations, the better prepared you are for the unknowns.